if you recall at that stage, um, temperatures on the farm, which is where I stay in the Midlands, were actually literally freezing with many of the water troughs having frozen solid during the night. We also had snow that weekend and I remember snuggling up next to the fire with my slippers on as we listened to the previous speaker talking, us, uh, talking to us about mindful movement. It was really so cold and a fireside chat seemed to be appropriate. But how quickly the season has changed. It's already too hot to sit next to a fire today. So we're gonna to have to change this in future, I think, to, to stoop chats um, throughout the warmer months. Um, and we're calling it stoop chats because it's, it's casual, it's interactive, and we don't want anybody to feel um, that it's too formal. In just one week, this farm has changed from a dull and gray color to an explosion of, of new color, new life, um, new growth erupting from the soil. It's been a hard winter on very many different levels, but spring has finally arrived. And my little, um, I wanted to tell you a little story about um, a tree. As you drive onto our farm, there is a massive oak tree at the top of a hill next to the road. And I call it my season tree, because as I drive back onto the farm from being away, I can always tell at a glance and from a distance what time of the year it is. Um, there are leaves, or perhaps there are no leaves, depending on the time of the year. And the color will always very specifically um, tell you where you're at and a fine display from a distance and even from the sky. In fact, if you're flying over the farm, you can see this massive tree. The tree truly is massive. Um, it takes three adults with arms outstretched like this to encircle the trunk of the tree at its base. We can only guess for how long it's been there, 50 years, 100 years, but it's still standing. What is truly remarkable about this tree is that it is growing in dreadful conditions. The soil is hard, baked clay. Very little else grows in this area. The tree is exposed to all the elements. And in this area, that means vicious storms. Mother Nature having a temper tantrum of biblical proportions sometime, really having her own um, Diwali celebrations, the Festival of Lights, with the lightning, the thunder, the hail, and very strong winds that funnel through that particular area. The tree is exposed to all these elements um, and continues to grow. And if you recall a couple of years ago, there was a dreadful drought um, throughout our country. Very, very little water, everything shriveled, so much died, but the tree stands. And despite all the odds, this tree has learned the ability to dig deep with a root system that surely goes deep into the earth as it search, searches for nutrients, for water, and to also help anchor her, I call the tree her, to the ground. Despite the weather conditions, this tree has survived and it is still standing strong and resilient. An interesting word that, resilient. And of course, it is the topic for today's discussion. I went to the dictionary, I did a bit of a Google search and I see that resilience is the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties. It's a type of toughness, the ability to spring back into shape, to rebound, to bounce back. Resilience exists when the person uses mental processes and behaviors to protect self from the negative effects of various stresses. So now I'm wondering, is it possible to be resilient in the face of something as huge as cancer? Can you learn resilience? And so with this in mind, we ask the expert. And I would like to introduce to you today's speaker. And it is my absolute honor to, to introduce Sandy Lewis to you, friend, mentor, role model, somebody who I want to be like desperately and somebody that we're going to learn from today. Sandy Lewis holds degrees in social work and business administration. Previously, between the years of 2000 and 2012, Sandy worked for ICAS in their training division, 
and she was also in private practice. She joined Akiso Clinics in May 2012 as the National General Manager for the Center of Psychotherapy Excellence, beautifully abbreviated COPE. In January 2015, she moved over to Akiso as the head of clinical quality and psychotherapy. Today, she works partly in that capacity and partly for NetCare in the employee mental wellness and people development space. Her current project has been to design and implement a training intervention to upskill um, and, and teach management and care teams of NetCare in the day-to-day -day implementation of compassion. The end goal is to operationalize compassion through the organization based on the principles of compassionomics. And so without further ado, as I said, my honor, Sandy, you are welcome. Thank you so much for teaching us and helping us learn with you. Over to you. Thank you very much for that warm and generous introduction, Ro. Um, I feel humbled to be introduced in such a lovely way. As Rowan said, we're going to talk about, uh, about how to be psychologically resilient under very, very difficult circumstances, probably some of the most difficult circumstances that any person can face, which is uh, being confronted with a cancer diagnosis. And I'm going to not just talk about resilience, but I'm going to talk a lot about compassion on the journey of coping with and managing and even growing through a cancer diagnosis. But when I talk compassion, I always start with self-compassion. We cannot offer compassion to anyone unless we have already filled our hearts and the essence of ourselves with vast amounts of loving kindness and compassion. And in fact, healing yourself is only possible when you've done a lot of work on building up a huge store of self-love, kindness to yourself, and compassion for yourself within your own body, your mind, and your spirit. And I rather liked this little quote by Brene Brown, which says, talk to yourself like you're talking to someone you love. And I'm going to focus some more on that as we go through. I beg your pardon, I just need to get the slideshow going. Okay. So I'm also going to talk uh, from a mental health perspective, um, because as you can see, I've got the logo up there. My, my background really is in psychiatry through the Akeso clinics that are now part of the NetCare group. But I was, I was very saddened. I, I couldn't get numbers from South Africa, but I found a study that had been done through the NHS in Scotland. And it, it says that sadly, cancer patients and their families are often left alone with their mental health st struggles. That in fact, people have not <clears throat> fully grasped what the mental health consequences of a cancer diagnosis are, not just for the individual who's been diagnosed, but for everyone around them, it's so enormously life-changing. And yet we're not forthcoming. Maybe we wait and become reactive rather than being proactive in preventing problems from arising. And oh my goodness, <clears throat> it's impossible to imagine a person coping physically with the illness 
And then also a diagnosis such as depression or anxiety or even more severe mental illness. I think it, 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 it sounds to me like it's almost impossible to find enough inner resources to cope on both those fronts. So we need to work, we need to advocate for a great deal more mental health support for our patients who are oncology patients. In the Scottish, Scottish study, they told us that almost half of patients, so one out of two, received no support or any advice, had had no conversations, about mental health issues, that where there is support, it's patchy and inconsistent. In other words, it's not woven into the system so that you can be sure that as you navigate your journey, you will be offered some sort of support for your mental health. 66%, that's two thirds, two out of three, said they'd received no information about what potential problems they might face at the beginning and then during and at the end of treatment. And I had some startling um, insights about how hard actually it is for patients at the end of treatment. Um, and we're gonna talk about that as well. So 60% of people said they wanted individual counseling. 42% in the study said they wanted information. And 51% said they wanted better communication from the healthcare worker team. Okay, so what's really important is when I started, I said cancer patients are left alone. And therefore, what we need to do is work towards cancer patients and their families not feeling alone, feeling supported, feeling held, feeling like they're part of a community. And I love this quote, and I believe in this quote, and it says people start to heal the moment they feel heard. And in fact, I'm going to go on and say that people start to heal the moment they feel held. And holding is a psychological concept, which I will talk about some more. We'll talk a lot today about being heard and being held. But how holding starts with self-love. My starting point is always self-love and self-compassion. And I rather like this little quote, which I want to share with you. And it says, stop trying to heal yourself, fix yourself, or even awaken yourself. Stop trying to fast forward the movie of your life. Let go even of letting go, because healing is not a destination. Your pain, your sorrow, your doubts, your longings and your fearful thoughts, they're not mistakes. They're not asking to be healed, they're actually asking to be held. Here, now, lightly, in the loving healing arms of present awareness. And that's your own present awareness and in the present awareness of people who will be caring for you. And in fact, a local psychologist who is a specialist in trauma and in fact works in the field of oncology has, has said in, in her PhD, she actually came up with this conclusion. She said that the deeply painful emotional experiences that we feel after a crisis become enduringly traumatic. In other words, become post-traumatic stress disorder when there is an absence of relationships or a connection with other people in which they can be held. And I just feel I want to say at this point that if your support systems are not robust, if you don't feel like you naturally can fall into a community, then I want to say that just remember that anyone who's part of this family has access to our oncology navigators in NetCare. 
and know that you will never have to walk the journey alone. You simply have to reach out and our wonderful navigators who I work with very closely will be there to make sure that you don't walk the journey alone. And I like, I like this. Um, I think it, it helps to make it more, um, more South Africanized. Um, that when I talk about communities and I talk about compassion and I talk about empathy, all of that is encapsulated in the whole principle and philosophy of Ubuntu. It really includes the essential human virtues, of compassion and common humanity. In the Kosa, it's translated as, I am because we are. It's not that whole individualized, I go it alone approach. I don't even exist without my community around me. And in the Zulu, Ubuntu Ngumuntu Ngabantu, which means a person is a person through other people. And I think that if we can truly embrace that, that I am only a person when I look into your eyes and recognize you as a person, and you do the same to me, then we are assured that we will have empathy for each other. And that when I can recognize that you are suffering, I will open my heart and offer you compassion. Compassion is the action you offer to alleviate the suffering of another person. But first I need to have my heart open so that I can see you and I can feel your suffering. It becomes even my suffering, but together we engage in compassionate action to lift the pain. So Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who has spoken a lot about Ubuntu says, it's about being open and available to other people and affirming other people and having a proper self-assurance. So I look into you and I feel a strength in my identity and you look into me and you feel a strength in your identity. So we are one. And if you're keen, you can, um, I'll send these to you, these slides, you can watch this lovely video where he actually talks about what Ubuntu means. And it's really very beautiful. So what we need to do is to create sacred listening spaces to combat loneliness because we can't heal alone. Because people will tell you, you know what truly aches? It's having so much inside you and not having the slightest clue of how to pour it out. But when you've got a person in front of you who's looking into your eyes with empathy and is open to bearing your suffering with you, it becomes easy to know how to pour it out because you feel safe and it just comes naturally. And you know, you don't have to be super trained in fancy skills because as James Hillman says, even people who come to counseling, they come for a blessing. They don't come necessarily to have whatever's broken fixed. They just want to have what's broken blessed. And essentially, that's where healing starts. I bless your suffering. I don't need to have whatever skills or knowledge are required to fix it. Just let me hear it and just let me bless it. So let's talk about some of the issues that cancer patients have to deal with. And it's, it's a lot. So first of all, there's the trauma. And a situation is traumatic when it violates familiar expectations about someone's life and the world they live in, sending them into a state of extreme confusion and uncertainty. And trauma doesn't only affect you when your world has been turned upside down, when everything that felt safe and familiar and known has been violated, then everyone around you feels that too. 
to a greater or a lesser extent. So I'm not sure how many of you on this call have had to sit in that awful moment that we all pray and wish we never have to experience. When somebody says to you, I found a cancer. It's a moment of trauma. It violates everything in your life that used to feel safe and familiar. And you can feel any or all of the following, disbelief, fear, sadness, anxiety, panic, anger. And in your body, you could feel like you can't breathe, like your heart is racing, like you're dizzy, you're sweating, you're shaking, you've got chest pains. You feel almost like you are choking. These are the reactions we will have. And in fact, we will expect from anyone when they have to hear that they have been diagnosed with a cancer. It's a deep trauma. And then there's grief. We are not sure now what our future holds after that moment of being told we've had a cancer. Everything we thought about our future in that moment is a temporary and maybe it lasts quite long loss of everything that we imagined had we had in store for us for our future. Now we don't know. And there's a huge amount of loss in that moment of those plans being ripped away from us. Because not to say that that means our life is being ripped away from us, but generally we're going to go through a long period of quite intensive and quite painful and quite invasive and quite difficult therapy or treatment. And that's going to kibosh our plans all on its own. So work and family responsibilities and all of the things that we took for granted, we now have lost the stability of knowing we can do that. And so there are losses at all stages of the cancer journey, right from the very beginning. Know that it's a natural physical and emotional response to any kind of loss. And even change brings loss. Grief is very hard to bear. I can read you this quote from Joan Didion, who lost her husband very suddenly. And she wrote so beautifully about her grief, but it's very raw because she talks so honestly about the terrible, terrible pain. And she says, grief when it comes is nothing we expect it to be. Grief has no distance. Grief comes in waves paroxysms, sudden apprehensions that weaken your knees and blind your eyes and obliterate the dailiness of love. And that's what I was alluding to. Everything that you took for granted about how your daily life would unfold, grief obliterates it. And that's why grief, grief is a terrible thing. And then there's anger. And anger is also a completely human and natural response. And we're often taught that anger is a forbidden emotion, that nice people don't get angry. But the research says that it's very important if we're angry once we've had a cancer diagnosis to be able to express it. That people who struggle with anger because it feels makes them feel like they're a bad person, often end up feeling helpless. And in fact, when you aren't allowing your anger, you stop fighting. Anger is energizing. Anger is protective. So anger is important. And all I'm saying here is allow the feeling. I'm not saying we're giving carte blanche on acting out that anger in destructive ways. I'm not saying we're going to bash up property or bash up people or talk with aggression. No, we deal with the anger, but it's important to just allow ourselves to feel it when we feel it. 
it's much more healthy to allow feelings of anger <clears throat> than a compliant sort of fatalism, which is, oh, well, I just give up, I'm not fighting. I've, I've, I've got no energy. That kind of what we in the mental health field called compliant fatalism, giving up really, it interferes with the effectiveness of your treatment because your treatment is fighting your cancer. But you also have to be fighting your cancer inside of you. And this actually comes from the Journal of Psychiatric Medicine. So when you look at anger, anger is often actually the tip of the iceberg. And underneath anger, there can be this variety of feelings. And in fact, it's only once you've allowed the anger to blow off the top of your head that you can sometimes access the much more vulnerable feelings underneath. And know that these are the feelings that actually make me feel very fragile and even scared in the world. And it's the anger that covers them up. But it's important that we can access these other feelings so that we know what we're really dealing with. These are the underlying issues. And you know it's often these underlying issues that are interfering with our healing, that these unresolved feelings that are emotional in nature, they're mental, mental health issues. They impact physically much more than we realize because our minds and our bodies are completely inseparable. So I talked about holding each other. And it's not an easy job, because when I say holding, I'm saying, I'm going to sit with you. I'm going to be willing to be with you in your experience without judgment. I'm not going to attempt to rescue you. I'm not going to, I'm, I can't fix it, and I'm not going to even try. I'm not going to say to you, don't be this or don't be that, or I'll, I'll find you a remedy for your illness. No, I'm not going to do any of it. I'm simply going to be there with you, making it entirely about you and your experience so that you can feel free to talk to me with absolute honesty and openness about what your experience is. And I am probably going to feel uncomfortable but I'm going to offer you absolute unconditional love. And that's what holding space means. So I'm going to sit there while you're angry. And I'm going to sit there through your moments of despair and your moments of hopelessness. And I'm even going to listen to you when you feel like you want to give up. But if I hold you, I will lend you my strength so that you do not in the end feel like you will give up because you will know that through all the despair, I'm sharing it with you and I'm walking this with you and I will lend you healing power as well. And then I think following on from that, What's really important is when we're witnessing or holding grief, we need to know, and we, we often get this wrong because we want to tell people, no, you mustn't feel like that, or no, you mustn't do that, or um, no, no, look on the bright side. And we rush into fixing by giving two quick false positives. So what we need to understand, first of all, is that each person's grief is as unique as their fingerprint. So we might learn all those stages of grief about 
um, shock and denial and anger and bargaining and all of those. But people the people haven't re all read that book. And I promise you, their bodies and their brains haven't read that book. So to quote someone who said, please just let me grieve however the hell I want. So what everyone has in common only is that however they grieve, they share a need for their grief to be witnessed without judgment, without prescription. That means that the person who's holding is not trying to lessen it or reframe it. They're just being fully present to the magnitude of the loss without jumping to fix it and particularly not jumping into trying to point out how this is actually a positive thing in the moment of deep loss. We need to allow you to feel your loss in all its enormity simply by holding space and witnessing it for you. Now, everybody who is making an adaptation to a cancer diagnosis is going to experience extreme emotion. And I've already touched, these are the emotions that are the most painful that any human being can bear. Grief, despair, sometimes hopelessness, anger at the unfairness of it. This is deep pain. And everybody, when they ad adapt to this diagnosis is going to struggle. That's a given. I think what I just want to say, though, is that sometimes the adaptation, it's gone beyond what we would expect normal suffering to look like, and it can become mental illness. But re really and truly, before we start to even talk about that, let us acknowledge and accept that emotions of extreme pain and distress after a diagnosis is normal and expected. And sometimes people might even not be able to contain those feelings and maybe they behave in ways that are unusual for them and a bit bizarre and strange for them. But we need to allow that as long as it's not destructive. And it's interesting because when I was reading what I learned was that we mustn't think that at the end of treatment, so now you've finished your course of chemo or radiotherapy or whatever treatment you've had. And then in some places they go and ring a bell and have a big celebration. And people say, you know, it's, it wasn't over for me at that point. That was maybe the worst point because at that point I actually felt like I was falling off a cliff edge because suddenly everybody disappears. Oh, well, you finished your treatment now. Surely you're going to be fine and we're out of here. And people say that for some of them was the worst, worst, worst moment. So we must not think that just because the treatment's finished, the support can disappear. It's a long, long, long journey. And we know that we go into remission but remission isn't saying, well, you know, I took out your appendix and off you go. So we need to allow and express all our feelings, however intense they are. And this is the patient and everyone around them. But there can be a point, and we need to talk about this, where the normal process of working through this trauma in your life it can turn into another illness altogether, which is a clinical depression and anxiety disorder or post-traumatic stress. And when you've tipped over, then you need to seek professional help from the mental health fraternity. But they need to be around and easily accessible through the whole journey. Not like where I started and I said, people, are, people say, I think I was at a tipping point. Two thirds of people 
say. I think I was at a tipping point during my journey. And I was falling from adjusting to actually becoming perhaps depressed. But there was nobody there to help me understand whether in fact I had developed a mental illness, helping me to actually make a proper diagnosis around it and then being around to treat it. So we need to be aware that it's really possible and that up to two thirds of people have said, I think I may have needed a mental health professional at that point. So just as a guideline, we medically diagnose a mental illness when these symptoms continue unabated, so unrelentingly without letting up for at least two weeks, impacting all the following areas of your life. So your mood is unstable. It's either much, much lower than you used to, but continuously for two weeks, or it's going up and down, which we know could be the trigger for a bipolar type of mood disorder. So when your mood is up and down, it's not the way you know it, and this goes on for two weeks, that's a sign. When your energy levels similarly dip for two weeks, or in fact you become hyper energetic for two weeks, that might be a sign. Where for two weeks, you're not continuing with your activities of daily life the way you usually do, to the extent that you are able, given that you are sick. But if you're still getting up and getting dressed and combing your hair and maybe putting some makeup on or you know, going to make tea or doing all those things, if for two weeks you're not doing those things as usual and you're not taking pleasure in the things that you usually do, so maybe just sitting in your garden or enjoying a little morning tea ritual with a friend or reading a book or tending your plants. If these are the things that give you pleasure, but for two weeks or more, you suddenly find, you know what? I'm doing this thing, but I'm feeling nothing. I'm feeling no satisfaction out of it. Then that's a sign. Changes in appetite. So in other words, if you don't want to eat, you just don't feel like eating. And again, also you take no pleasure. We all love eating. But if you start to lose pleasure in eating, or you just feel like your energy is so low, you can't be bothered to make food. And this goes on for two weeks. That's a problem. For some people, they say, I feel so hollow and empty on the inside. My depression is like hollowness, a void on the inside. And actually, I can't stop eating. It's almost like I'm using food to fill up that emptiness. And I'm ob obsessional, I'm binge eating. That can be a sign. And it goes on, it's not just a day or two, but this is going on and on for a couple of weeks. And the same thing for sleep, where you start to feel like, I don't want to wake up in the morning. So in fact, I'm actually going to try and sleep my way through the day and the night. Or otherwise, you somehow become agitated and you can't sleep. And this goes on for a few weeks. And where your thought patterns change. So often it's helplessness where you start to feel, I was fighting this thing. I was thinking, I'm going to get through this thing. And then these are my plans. These are the things I'm going to do. But you stop thinking thoughts about the future and thinking, well, there is a future. And these are all the nice things I'm going to do. But that all stops and the thoughts become bleak and negative and pessimistic and dark. Or otherwise the thoughts become overly around worry. I can't stop obsessively worrying about this or that or the next thing. And it goes on and on. It's not just for a brief period of time. It's 
excessive, obsessive worry. That's a problem where there's a, a total loss of help. Two of the uh, defining characteristics of depression are hopelessness and helplessness. So I feel hopeless and I feel helpless to do anything about it, which really is a form of giving up. Oh, it's, it's, it's a form of compliant fatalism, which we talked about under the anger topic, which really is, I just surrender to this and I give up. And then self-worth, where you actually start to have very, very negative thoughts about yourself, that you're a burden to other people, that uh, you're not worthy of being saved from this illness and treated and fixed, you know, why bother? Um, that's also a key symptom. So when the ability to function every day is impaired, when there is a desire to escape through sleep or sometimes through substance use, alcohol, painkillers, or whatever else you might use to, es to, to escape your life that is, in fact, destructive towards you or destructive towards your family, then illness has set in. And we need to treat it then. We treat it biologically with medication. We treat it psychologically with therapy. And we treat it socially by reintegrating you into communities of support and care. We put the Ubuntu back into your life. So when we're recovering from trauma, I like this model that Dr. Neil Greenberg has put together. He calls it the psychological I'm first aid. I'm model. Getting up. Please, oh, I was going to say, please mute. Um, so Dr. Greenberg put together this, um, he's a trauma psychiatrist, and he put together this little package of psychological first aid. And he says there are really four steps you need to take to offer psychological first aid to yourself. And I think I want to say that if you're in a normal adaptation process where you are suffering and you're struggling, but you're still swimming, you're not drowning, then if you use these, you should remain able to swim, even in these terribly difficult, strongly choppy waters. Hey. So we need to promote a sense of physical and emotional safety. Trauma obliterates and shatters our sense of safety. So we want to put back a sense of safety. We want to try and restore calm because we have in this absolute explosion of panic and fear and worry in the beginning stages. But we can't stay there because that is actually going to make us physically even sicker. So we want to put back calm. We want to make sure that we're not doing this alone. So we're promoting connectedness. Well, and then we're trying to promote hope. So we're not falling into that compliant fatalism. So let's just quickly run through them one by one. Safety. Safety is created on all of these levels. So we start with the, with the more practical things. We look after our physiological, our biological needs. So we make sure that first of all, we've got all of air, water, food, shelter, we're sleeping, we're clothed, no, never mind reproduction, I don't think that's appropriate here. But essentially, we first look after our biological needs. And when those are in place, but as you can see, they are the base of the pyramid, they're actually what holds the pyramid in place. Then we look at safety needs that are above the physical needs, personal security, employment, resources, health, and property, making sure your home is safe. And, and we can't take any of this for granted because a cancer diagnosis can be a threat to both of these levels of this pyramid. These two are the base of the pyramid. So obviously, cancer would make us physically sick. And therefore, it, it can be a threat to can we eat?
can we hydrate, can we sleep, etc. But also, once we're in the illness phase and we're being actively um, treated, because treatment is so long and can be such a hard impact on us, we often need to look at issues of keeping our jobs safe, keeping ourselves safe, because it can be very expensive to go down this journey and it can therefore threaten our safety needs. And then we go up the pyramid. So we take these one at a time, and then love and belonging. It's really important then to call in our friends, people we're intimate with and our family and our sense of connection. And then it's also really important that we're taking care of loving ourselves, our self-respect, our self-esteem. Don't worry about status. I think status isn't, isn't, isn't appropriate here. It's, we're looking at survival, not status. But still to be recognized, even if we're ill. Strength and freedom. And even when we're sick, to not stop moving towards becoming the best that we can be. And there are many people who have been down this journey and who have suffered terribly, but have said, you know, the suffering stripped away so many layers of me. The layers that were actually me just being a social creature, um, meeting the needs of other people and society. But I stripped those off during my illness because I had to dig so deep inside of me. And I actually discovered a new person, a whole different person. And then I realized that that person actually had different goals in life. And, and then I actually embarked on many different avenues that I wouldn't have considered if I hadn't have got so sick. And for, for the people who can walk that journey and in fact rediscover the true essence of themselves and their purpose in this life, we can call that in fact the growth post-trauma. So in fact, for some people, they'll say having the illness brought me to self-actualization. I actually found myself because I had to. I was in survival mode. And then calm. So you think about all the activities that are soothing for you. I understand you had the mindful movement, people talking to you last time. Breathing exercise, going into nature, pursuing your hobbies, and just working with your five senses, music, visual beauty, taste and touch, everything that is soothing to the nervous system, to practice them every day. To calm the nervous system takes time because trauma shatters us. And we don't heal immediately. You go for major surgery, you don't heal immediately. It takes probably two months of practicing calmness every day to bring your nervous system back to its pre-traumatized state. And then promoting connection. And we know from research that our social support and long-term relationships reduce stress and promote mental health. And connectedness leads to compassion. And I love this little quote, it's from the Dalai Lama. And he says, love and compassion are necessities, not luxuries. Without them, we as humanity cannot survive. That's why I, I'm stressing this issue of connection and community and support so strongly. And just saying, if you don't have it, reach out to us, we can provide it. And then we talked about hope. And um, I found this lovely piece called Hope as a Strategy. You know, in, in corporates where we work, um, 
sometimes they say to us, what's your strategy? What's your business strategy for the next year? And then if you're not well versed in the ways of corporate life, you might say, well, what I'm hoping is that says, uh -uh, hope is not a strategy. <laughs> but this piece says, hope is your strategy. So I'm saying hope is a strategy. And what the authors of this article, Hope is a Strategy, say is, no matter what stage one's cancer is, setting short-term and long-term goals will help define and achieve your life's purpose or purposes. Survivors are well advised to hope for the best, but prepare for the worst. I know that's a hard balancing act, but that's what we try to do. And if we're very calm and we're very mindful, and we live in the present moment, not worrying too much about the future. We can make the best of each day and know that whatever comes, we will make the best of each day. So we know that this journey may end in a transition, but we'll be calm about that. And we'll prepare for that. We won't be stressed about it. So we hope for the best and prepare for the worst. We can live with hope for a cure or a remission. Or if we can't achieve those, a stable cancer, but without suffering and enjoy a high quality of life with our family and friends for as long as possible. Serious illness is a reminder that we're not immortal, but those who can respond creatively to a life-threatening illness hear it as a wake-up call, a reminder of how short time is and that life is precious. They do what matters most while they can, experience the joys of living and of loving, and let the people around them know how much they are loved and appreciated. And really, if you do that, for a few months or a few years, it doesn't make a difference. The fact is, if you get to experience what matters most, the joys of living and loving, and bringing the people who matter to you around you, you have lived your purpose. Whether it's a long-term or a short-term, realizing of your purpose doesn't matter. The fact is, you've done it. What I can say is many people who've never had the wake-up call actually never even get there. And looking after yourself, and that's really important, and this little model is called the SEEDS model, but I like to call it SEEDS with a double S. So the SEEDS stand for making social contacts, E, Try to exercise a little bit every day, whatever you're capable of. A friend of mine is not well, and she walks around her house. She says, on a good day, I walk five times around the house. On a bad day, I don't walk any. But I, I walk anything between one to five times around my house. And if that's what you can do, then that's super. E for education, learn new things. Take classes and read books. This is a tremendously powerful form self-care so keep learning it doesn't matter how old you are what your state of health is you can always keep learning d for diet eat well and if you're not sure how best to eat with your illness then go and ask one of the members of the team a dietitian or a nutritionist how shall i eat to keep myself in optimal health under my circumstances Okay, and then they sleep, have lots of good sleep. Listen to your body, it will tell you when you're tired and it will tell you when you need to wake up. And then the other S is for spirituality, practicing spirituality, which is incredibly important. And then actually there's another S, which is self-compassion. So, we show ourselves oodles and boodles and caboodles on top of that of self-kindness. Being warm and understanding towards ourselves, especially 
when we suffer or fail or feel inadequate. In those moments, you bring more warmth and understanding to yourself. Honor and accept your full humanness in all its frailty. The more you open your heart to your reality, and that reality may be a cancer diagnosis, the more you actually open your heart to it and embrace and accept it, instead of fighting against it, the more you'll be able to feel compassion for yourself. And then the compassion actually tends to overflow and you can extend it to other people. Compassion is tremendously healing, both in giving and receiving. And for me, self-love is the most powerful medicine. I know this from my own experience. So you can take a self-compassion break during the day. If you're in a lot of pain, if you're suffering at any point during any day, just stop and pause and just acknowledge to yourself, in this moment, I'm aware that I'm suffering. I'm not the only one who's suffering. I know that other people are suffering too. What I'm gonna do is take a minute just to love myself and give myself compassion in this moment of suffering until it eases up. And that is just such a powerful little practice that you should do many, many times in the day. Awareness, knowing you're not alone and just giving yourself as much loving and compassionate energy as you can and letting it flow to the places where you hurt. Do you know where your focus and attention goes? Your energy flows. And then spirituality. It's a source of strength that helps patients cope with cancer experiences. That spirituality helps to define wellness during treatment and survivorship, helps people to find meaning in their lives find a sense of health and make sense of your cancer experience during illness. So spirituality is very important along this journey. Patients who are spiritual may utilize their beliefs to cope with their illness, to cope with pain and life stress. And some studies show that those who are spiritual tend to have a more positive outlook, a better quality of life, reduced stress, more peace, and then better ability to manage challenges. So you can choose whatever spiritual practice works for you. It might be prayer. It might be the presence and touch of a loved and trusted person who brings light and healing energy. You feel other people's energy. You know who brings you light and healing energy. Ask them, come, please, come. Lay your, lay your hands on me. Bring your presence to me. Bring your light and healing energy. Lend it to me because I need it. Meditation, I do a lot of that. Little rituals, maybe candle lighting, pray, uh, songs and prayer, music. Give yourself a little time to do a, a, a ritual. Joining a congregation of faith. Intentionally clarifying your life purpose and its meaning. Making peace with all that lives around you and especially with yourself and connecting to your higher power. Making peace with life's transitions. We're born, we live, we die. It's a given. We, we need to accept that it's no, there's no fighting. it. And living in the moment with full mindfulness and presence with as much gratitude as we can find, not fake gratitude. Acknowledging there are things that I'm suffering with and I'm in pain and sometimes I'm not feeling good. But I'm also noticing that there are still some things that I am grateful for. It's both and. It's not either or. And then just finally, a little teaching on transitions by Thich Nhat Hanh, who is a Vietnamese monk. And he says, this body is not me. I am not limited by this body. 
I am life without boundaries. I have never been born and I have never died. Look at the ocean and the sky filled with stars, manifestations from my wondrous true mind. Since before time, I have been free. Birth and death are only doors through which we pass, sacred thresholds on our journey. Birth and death are a game of hide and seek. So laugh with me, hold my hand. Let us say goodbye, say goodbye to meet again soon. We meet today, we will meet again tomorrow. We will meet at the source every moment. We meet each other in all forms of love. So be at ease and be at peace it will enable you to heal more effectively. The happiness we seek is already here and it will be found through letting go rather than through struggle. These are two quotes from Pema, Pema Chodron, who's also a monk. And she says, it's such a huge help in working with our crazy mixed up minds to remember that what we're doing is unlocking a softness that is in us and letting it spread. We're letting it blur the sharp corners of self-criticism and complaint. And actually that softness helps to heal our illness too. And I'm going to stop sharing there because I've talked such a lot. My goodness, Sandy. That was beautiful. Have I, have I stopped sharing? You've stopped sharing. Okay, good. <laughs> would you like to say anything else before we open to the floor no i feel like i've said too much your words were wise and beautiful and compassionate and kind as we were hoping for thank you so much for sharing oh it's this my honor really honor and my privilege to be here with you Thank you. And to share some of what I've learned and from my own suffering. We share and we teach. Thank you. Absolutely. From the floor, from all the participants, perhaps um, if the hosts could perhaps um, unmute and um, allow people just to, to share, ask questions, um, thoughts. Um, as we said in the beginning, this is a safe space and we really would like to be there for one another. Any comments out there? I see there have been some wonderful uh, comments coming through on the little chat box. Um, Gretchen, you were saying no one escapes pain, fear and suffering. Yet pain comes wisdom from fear comes courage, from suffering can come strength. If we have the virtue of resilience, deep words. Um, anybody else like to say anything? I see Sandy, there was a request. Um, if your presentation could be emailed to some of the participants, would you be comfortable with that? Very much so. Very much so. It was a lot. So people can then slowly maybe just, just read, it, read it again and digest. It. Yes. There was a part that you were talking about the symptoms, common symptoms of mental wellness. And some of them I tweaked on. So particularly fatigue, um, altered energy levels and appetite changes. And of course, for most of our patients, um, from a physical point of view, yes. those are very common symptoms. Yes. So I what I would say, things. yes. So what I would say is, if your symptoms are probably symptoms of the treatment you're having or, or your illness, like fatigue and like energy, then don't just look at them on their own. So in other words, if you've got those two, we have to say, all right, let's eliminate those and let's see if we've got some of the others, mm -hmm. particularly your mood, your sense of hope, and most importantly, your sense of self-worth. And the minute you start thinking you're a burden or you're better off, not you, other people are better off without having 
to worry about you or it's not worth you fighting this because you don't deserve it or those kinds of thoughts mm. those talk to me more of depression yeah and interestingly enough and and from this group that we have on today as well we have patients patients people that have yes. this diagnosis of of cancer we also have a lot of carers and family members on the call as well and so we see the strange from both sides um, where the carers can also start feeling worthless, exhausted, overwhelmed. Um, am I making any difference? Um, oh my and, goodness, yes. It, it really is something that's not a burden, but it's overwhelming so often. Absolutely. And it's very hard to be a carer when somebody very close to you has such a serious illness because you do want to do your very best to assist the person who's sick. What you didn't expect was that probably you were going to have to do this on top of everything else you did in a busy life. And this has come something extra. And now it's a huge drain on your energy, your time. It's probably cutting into your ability to take care of yourself for that very reason there's no there's no time and it is a very normal human reaction mm. to sometimes feel compassion fatigue yes i have got compassion but i'm really tired mm. and it's important then to also reach out into your own support systems or into the support systems offered by cancer and net care so that we can also feed you and hold you. You're holding the patient, but you also need to be held. Mm. So there's no, there must never be any shame to be thinking, gosh, I'm so tired. I'm not sure that I can do this anymore. Yeah. And then, of course, the very common flip side of the coin is the person themselves that has the cancer feeling as dreadful and and going through all of the side effects and and concerns and fears and angers and grief etc really worried about being a burden yes. to that loved one to that one that's caring seeing that they're getting very very tired and perhaps coping mechanisms are not optimal anymore and it it leads for a a frightening time it's, su it's such a frightening time. But I must say that what, what, was, what is really important is not to sit quietly and worry about being a burden. I think the important thing is to have that difficult conversation. And it isn't an easy conversation to say, I actually need to ask you, am I a burden to you? But if you ask, and you can have an honest conversation about it, the person might say, you know what? I'm a little tired, but you're not a burden. I want to be doing this. Mm. And if I wasn't doing this, I would feel awful. So I'll just take a bit of time out and I'll go and look after myself, but then I'll come back and I'll do it again with an absolute loving heart. Mm. And then you don't need to sit there thinking, oh my goodness, I'm a burden. It's going to make, make you feel terrible. Just have the difficult conversation. Sure often not quite that easy because no no it's not oh. it's not it's not easy but it's the only way yeah it's the only way sure such wise words i'm trying to look through our little chat room over here um and i'm seeing thank you so much sandy wonderful presentation so powerful um wise words sandy um there's also a comment from Gretchen. Any feedback or comments, please, you're welcome to send to Gretchen on her email address or info at cancer. Thank you again, Sandy. Um, from, from Kylo, I'm starting radiation soon. Oh, Kylo, I wish, I, I wish you all the strength. Yes. Um, and it's not easy. I know my mum had radiation and, she, and it, it burnt her and it was painful and was difficult. So don't do it by yourself. Please just reach out and if there's pain, ask for pain relief. 
That was one of the things. Yes. Now I was going to say the cheerleaders. Where are your cheerleaders, Kyle? Where are exactly. you in your corner? Exactly. We try to make sure that we reduce your pain to the minimum possible level. That's what the team is here for. But I also see that there are some newly diagnosed patients here today. And I just wish you all the strength. And I send you all my love as you embark on your journey. Thank you so much. Are there any other messages? Anything else that anyone would like to unmute and talk or chat about? You can share a story, you can make a comment, anything. There's no rules here. We try to work from our hearts. There's no rules. It looks like we've got some shy people and, and that's okay. That's all yes. right. No, it's, it's hard to talk in front of a lot of people. Very much so, but please reach out to us individually, reach out to us as a group. Please join us on our next support group, which is always on the fourth Saturday of each month. Um, it's at 10 o'clock, not at half past eight, it's at 10 o'clock. And we try and make it available from 10 to half past 11. Uh, Gretchen has reminded us that there's telecounseling yes, from the cancer that's available. Thanks, um, Gretchen. Please don't walk this journey alone. We are here. We want to be here to, to support and hold and bless you through this, this difficult journey of cancer. And, and in fact, I'm going to type in the chat the number for the um, psychiatric crisis line as well. Please do, Sandy. That would be great. And while Sandy's doing that, um, please grab a pencil and some paper and just write down the, the telephone numbers and the contact details that you might need. We, when we officially close off this meeting, we'll, we'll stay on for a little bit, just so that um, you can write down the details from that chat. Sandy, thank you for joining us. Your time is precious. And I'm so grateful that you have shared this wisdom with us. You have made a difference. You've taught us. I learned so much listening to you as always. So thank you. Oh no, it's a deep pleasure. And thank you for trusting me to come and talk to you all today. I, I don't take that for granted. All right, everybody. So okay. um, cheerio I, I to all. I shall say goodbye then. Thank you, Sandy. Bye-bye now. Have a lovely rest of your weekend. I don't know what's been happening in the rugby, for those that it is important to know. I do hope uh, green and gold have come through. No, um, they haven't. A very oh. close game. <laughs> right. Mental resilience. They needed Let's to get learn strong. the session about resilience. <laughs> You're right. I, I think we need to send them a copy of this, which we won't. But <laughs> thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, uh, you're welcome to leave the session now as you feel fit. We will try and send out the invitations for the next meeting within the next week or two. Um, have a beautiful weekend that lies ahead. Thanks all. Bye bye now. Rowan, and just before we, just before you close up, I just want to remind everybody that's joining our session today that they, at the end of the day, resilience is knowing that you are the only one that have the power to pick yourself up. That's all from me. Thank you, Rowan. Thank you, Gretchen. Thanks all. Bye now. Right.
There we go. Just try and start 